it's an honor to be here. Uh, my first time in Mexico. Uh, it's an honor to be here. I, it's an honor to be uh, among such passionate people. I arrived here uh, yesterday from Iran. I flew from Tehran to Mexico City uh, and then to Guadalajara. I, gave, I lectured all over uh, Iran at universities in Mashhad, in Isfahan, and in Tehran. And in Tehran, I even got to speak at a mosque. Uh, I'm, I'm a Catholic. Here I am sitting in the imam's chair in a mosque in Tehran. There, the audience is as big as the room is as big as this one. And there are young men, the women sit in another place, young men sitting cross-legged on prayer rugs across the room listening to me. I've never had an experience like this in my life. And why are they listening to me? Well, because uh, they want to hear about America. And what do they want to hear about America? They want to hear why, why have they done this to us, the Iranians. Beginning in 1953, the United States has had un, uh, un, a continual, continuous stream of uh, warfare, psychological warfare against the Iranian people. And still the Iranian people are interested in having an American come and talk to them and explain not just that, but uh, what I actually talked about was Hollywood and the Jewish control of Hollywood. This idea is now, as, as Dr. Duke has said, is spreading throughout the world. I was in India in January. I got to speak, speak to people there. India is now being inundated with the Americanized culture that, that destroyed my country in the 1960s. India is now going through the sexual revolution that America went through in the 1960s. India is now being enslaved by usury in the same way that the United States was. And the Indians, unlike the Iranians, are totally unprepared for what is happening to them. Totally unprepared. And so as a result, there's a violent reaction in India to what I'm talking about. You probably know that there is an epidemic of rape going on in India. Uh, national, international news, uh, Jayoti Singh in December of 2014 was brutally raped and killed. Why is this happening? Because it's happening because of the sexualization of their culture. And the people there don't understand anything about what's happening. And there are politicians. Uh, I won't name the politician, but he just spoke with President Obama a few weeks ago who are using this opportunity to demonize Christians. There is a resurgence of Hindu fundamentalism in England, I'm sorry, in India, where the Hindu fundamentalists are burning down Christian churches. A 70-year-old nun was raped in India. All because, not because the Indians are bad people, but because they sense that their culture is being destroyed, they don't understand how and why their culture is being destroyed. They're angry about it, and so they take it out on innocent victims, like women and Christians. One of the things that I did in India, <clears throat> I was fortunate enough to meet a group of people that I never even knew existed. These people are known as the Ho people. Uh, there's a related tribe called the Bihor people. They live in the mountains uh, of the Diocese of Jamshedpur. Uh, not too long ago, they lived, in, lived off of eight uh, monkey meat, was their main uh, form of nourishment. Uh, and whenever people from the diocese, I was there as part of a Catholic priest, took me there, my pastor. Whenever someone would approach them, a social worker would approach them, they'd run away and hide. These people now have a village. Uh, they make rope, largely because of the efforts of these, these uh, Catholic social workers. But the interesting thing about this is, this is, in a sense, what you would call ground zero of ethnic life on this planet. They are the classic ethnic group. They are a tribe. The, the, the name of the tribe is also means human being. They're in many ways like the Yanomami in the, in the Amazon rainforest. 
uh, they live they lived a completely isolated life in the mountains, living in trees, eating monkeys, until finally the civiliz civilization in came to them, and now they're trying to be integrated into this group of people. This is um, a story that I'd like to talk about today, because in a sense, this has happened throughout the world and throughout history. It's happening right now. It began, it happened here 500 years ago when the Spaniards arrived. Uh, it's the story of history. It is the story of history, and I'd like to talk about the implications of this story of history for us right now. One of the places where this happened in a famous way in the Americas was in Paraguay. Paraguay. Does anyone know what the official language of Paraguay is? Is it Spanish? How many people think it's Spanish? How many people think it's Portuguese? The official language of, Port of Paraguay is Guarani. What is Guarani? It was an ethnic language uh, of the people, the indigenous people. Why is it that that is the official language? The reason is the Jesuits showed up in Paraguay in the 15th century, 16th century, went in and lived with these people. They learned their language, and the Je it was a Jesuit who wrote the grammar of the Guarani language, and he wrote the dictionary of the Guarani language. And that preserved that language, and that language preserved that people. There are many other ethnic groups in this area, in Paraguay. Some of them were, had their uh, languages uh, uh, codified by other Jesuits. Some of these books were destroyed when the Freemasons destroyed the Jesuit uh, relations in Paraguay. Some of these people never had their language codified. If you don't have your language, codified, if you don't have a grammar, if you don't have a dictionary, you will not exist as a people. And so this is the beginning of the story that I want to talk about today, which is basically why ethnos, which is the ethnic group, why it needs logos, which is the Greek word for reason. I'd be, like to begin by talking about Germany, about the rise of the German nation out of the various ethnic groups that live there. I am a product of the German ethnic group. Half of me is German, half of me is Irish. If you go back to the time of the Roman Empire, my descendants were the people that crossed the Rhine, crossed the Danube, and they were known as barbarians. Okay, They had lots of different names. There were lots of different names uh, for these people. The Suevi, we don't know who they are, the, 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 the Schwaben, I guess you would call them now. The Grauthungi, who are the Grauthungi? Uh, we could go down the list of one tribe after another that was part of this thing that eventually became what we now call the German nation. And that didn't happen until 1871. So we have thousands of years of these people and a gradual type of development. The rise of the German nation began with the arrival of Napoleon on German soil. On October, October 13th, 1806, after watching Napoleon ride out of Jena on his way to defeating the Prussian army, the philosopher Hegel, who had just completed the phenomenology of mind, wrote, I saw the emperor, the soul of the world, go out from the city to survey his reign, it is truly wonderful a wonderful sensation to see such an individual concentrating in one point while seated on the horse as he stretches over the world and dominates it. The arrival of Napoleon in Germany was a catastrophe for the German people. But Hegel was a man who understood that oftentimes out of catastrophe God can bring good. He has a concept where he talks about this. It's called, he calls it the list, the list de Vernunft, the cunning of reason. God is in charge of human history, according to Hegel. And as soon as you say that, the first problem is, well, what about evil? Well, the answer is, God can bring good out of evil. And the good that God brought out of the evil of Napoleon's conquest for the German people was the German nation. That didn't happen overnight but it began at this point. 
This was the end of the Holy Roman Empire. It was a thousand year event. It was like the end of the Roman Empire, something that happens every thousand years. There were people at the time of Rome, uh, St. Jerome was an example, who felt that the church could not exist without the Roman Empire, that the world could not exist without the Roman Empire, and it then went down, it was destroyed. The result of Napoleon's conquest of Germany had two effects, as I said. The first one was the rise of German nationalism, and the second was the emancipation of the Jews. The Jews were never considered citizens in Europe up until this point. Napoleon, by fiat, said we are all equal. Remember, liberty, fraternity, equality. That's the motto of the French Revolution. Therefore, Jews are equal. Therefore, they have the same rights. That's the end of the story. Well, it wasn't the end of the story. By the time Napoleon returned from Jena to Strasbourg, the people of Strasbourg were complaining about the Jews one year after they had been emancipated. There was trouble. The trouble, uh, when Napoleon crossed the Rhine, the first thing he did was to loot the treasuries of German princes. One of the princes, the richest princes in Germany, was the Prince of Hesse Castle. He made a lot of money by renting out soldiers. They came to Trenton, New Jersey, and they fought against uh, the Americans, George Washington, at this time. Prince of Hesse Castle knew that he had his gold, took his gold to a man in Frankfurt by the name of Meyer Amschel Rothschild, Rothschild of Deutsch, gave him the money for safekeeping, and that money was then taken out to Rothschild's son, Nathan, who lived in England, and this is the beginning of the English uh, fortune, the, the, the Jewish-English fortunes in, in that country. These two elements worked side by side for the rest of the 19th century. You had, in a sense, the rise of the Jews, and the rise of the German nation at the same time going back and forth throughout this period. In 1819, less than 10 years after the end of the Napoleonic Wars, there was a riot in riots all throughout Germany. Uh, they were known as the Hep Hep riots because the, uh, the Germans would shout Hep Hep. Uh, it was, uh, uh, they were attacks against Jewish, uh, Jewish uh, users, Jewish businesses. The standard explanation is that uh, the reason these people did this was because they were anti-Semites. This is not the reason. The reason is because the Jews were destroying basically the business practices of all the Germans. They were agents for the English at this time. They were importing cheap English goods into Germany, and they were driving all the German businessmen to the wall. The people who rioted were largely uh, apprentices, people who had been frozen out of the economy, people who couldn't make money anymore. What began became clear over the course of this period of time is that the Jews weren't like everyone else. They were different. This is why in Christian countries throughout Europe, they had not been granted citizenship because the people there understood that they had no allegiance to whatever principality or country they lived in. The church dealt with this for two, almost two millennia, had been dealing with this for almost two millennia by this point. They had come up with a modus vivendi of living with the Jews that was known as secret judeus non. Secret judeus non was a two-part teaching on the part of the Catholic Church. On the one hand, no one has the right to harm a Jew. No one has a right to destroy the Jew synagogue. No one has a right to uh, desecrate Jewish cemeteries. On the other hand, the Jew has no right to destroy Christian culture. The Jew should not be appointed as a teacher in Christian schools because he has this, what should I say, this, this drive to undermine the morals and the faith of every Christian he comes in contact with. Why does he have this? 
Why does he have this? In order to understand this, in other words, why is the Jew a revolutionary? Why is, why is it that the Jews were in the forefront of every revolutionary movement in European history? Whether it's Bolshevism, whether it's whatever revolution it is, why are they there? To answer that question, we have to go back to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was the Messiah of the Hebrew people. The Hebrew people, when Jesus Christ came, they had to decide, do we accept this Messiah or do we reject him? This leads to a crisis with the Messiah. The majority of the Jewish people wanted to be accepted on racial grounds. There's, if you can go to the Gospel of St. John, the Jews tell Jesus, we are the sperma Abraham. We are the seed of Abraham. We have special DNA. And Jesus Christ rejects racism. And when Jesus Christ rejected racism, this racism, the majority of the Jews rejected Jesus Christ. What does it mean when you reject Jesus Christ? Who is Jesus Christ? He is the Son of God. What, what is this? What do we call this? What would Hegel call this? He would call God reason. And the Greeks called it logos. Jesus Christ, logos is the order of the universe. Jesus Christ was the logos incarnate. And they killed him. And not only did they kill him, they chose a revolutionary in his place. They said, give us Barabbas. Give us Barabbas. And by doing that, by choosing that revolutionary, by rejecting Jesus Christ, the Logos, they rejected all order in the universe. They rejected the order that God placed in the universe, and that's why they're revolutionaries. And they will never stop being revolutionaries until they stop their rejection of Jesus Christ. That is their destiny. That is our destiny. Because all of history from the time of the crucifixion up to the present day, is going to be the struggle between the forces of Logos or Christ or anti-Logos and the Jewish revolutionary. That's what history is. That's what Hegel understood. Hegel felt that Christianity was the culmination of history. He felt this way because reason Reason can understand a, 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 a much about the universe. It can't understand all about the universe because the mind of man is not equal to the mind of God. And so when Logos, which appeared in Greece in the fourth century, uh, was incorporated by St. John when he wrote his gospel in Greek, this was the merger of these two streams of history. And now history had reached a final stage because now God revealed himself through history and explained to the people what things like the Trinity was. Man can exist in, he can exist for himself, okay? But he can only exist as a creature of God. And his destiny is his reason because we are created as rational creatures. And so anytime a man goes against reason, he's going against God and he's going against his own nature. What we see here is when I told, when I gave these speeches in India or in Iran, what I said was, what are the, what do the Jews do to take over your culture? They persuade you to abandon your reason. And how do they do that? By pandering to your passions. And one of the main instruments of Jewish control in this world is pornography. Uh, I said this and I was called an anti-Semite. Then a, a Jewish professor by the name of Abrams, he said it. But he said it was good, and that got published in the, the Jewish Quarterly in England. So it's only wrong if I say it. It's not wrong if they say it. Hegel died in 1831. He was a man, in my estimation, who took an understanding of God's action in history as far as it could go. We are now in one of those moments of history, I think, that was like the moment uh, he was experiencing when Napoleon entered Germany. We are now, uh, uh, perhaps because I was in Iran, I'm, I'm interested in the nuclear agreement that the United States will probably conclude with the Iranians. What this is, is history is like a river. 
and the river comes to some narrow point. And if we are like boats on the river. We are not the authors of our own motion. We have free will, but the river moves us in a direction. And what I'm saying at this point is that this, these boats are coming closer together on this river for both negative and positive reasons. If you, uh, when I was flying into Iran, uh, there was a German magazine called Stern. Uh, uh, journalist, German journalist had gone to uh, Iraq to meet with the, le the head of ISIS, or IS, the Islamic State there. He gets out of the car, crosses Turkey, crosses the border, gets out of the car. First person he confronts there is a German. This man, his name is Christian. He's now called, he now calls himself Abu Dhabi or something like that. What is a man with a name like Christian? He's a Christian. What is this man doing in Syria with people like this? He's a Nietzschean. He believes in the will to power. He doesn't believe in right and wrong. He believes if he has the power, he can do whatever he wants. And that's why he's there. He's a nihilist, and these are Islamic nihilists, and this is bringing the nihilists of the world together. And so what does he say to the journalist? He says to him, would you like to see a beheading? We have prisoners. We can behead them for, for your benefit. You can take pictures of it. I can behead a, a Shia, if you like. Or if you like, I'll behead a Christian. These people are monsters. These people are barbarians, and they are being drawn together. There are 50,000 European nihilists who are working with these people. The other side of the coin is what I experienced in Iran when, they, when I was invited to speak at a mosque in Tehran. I'm a Catholic. The mullah invites me in, and there I'm speaking at a mosque, because we are being drawn together too. Because What, what, is, what do we believe in? Do we believe in the will to power in decapitating people? No, we believe in the moral law as an expression of God's will. And we follow that law. And therefore, we're different than those people. Hegel, as I said, took this farther than anyone. Hegel died in 1831. And when Hegel died, what we call idealism, Logos died with him. And it was replaced by something that had a pernicious effect on European history, and that was materialism. The first expression of materialism uh, of significance was Karl Marx who had a theory called dialectical materialism, okay? Karl Marx was a perversion of Hegel. Anyone who knows Hegel knows that only Geist can be dialectic, only the spirit can be dialectic. Matter is not like that. And so what you have was a corrupting effect on European thought that persisted and increased throughout the 19th century. One of the expressions of this turn to materialism was the rise of racial thought in Europe. I'm talking about the publication of Count Arthur de Gobineau's essay, Essay sur l'inégalité des races humaines, in France, 1855. The word race is a foreign word to German speakers, one which is frequently spelled race to emphasize its foreign origin. The word does not exist in the works of Goethe its gradual replacement of the Germanic word folk, which means people, gives a good indication that racial thinking is one foreign, number one, foreign in origin to the German thought, and number two, on its rise during the latter part of the 19th century. In his essay, Gobineau claimed that the German race was the highest and noblest of all races on earth, and that the Germans became the carriers of high culture wherever it had appeared on earth. Needless to say, this ensured a good reception in Germany. And one of the first people to pick up Gobineau's book was the composer Richard Wagner, who read Gobineau's Dramino Renaissance as well as the Asiatic novellas. In 1879, racial thinking took another step forward with the publication of Der Sieg des Judentums über das Christentums. In that book, Wilhelm Marr invented the term anti-Semitism as his way of dealing with Jewish cultural influence on a secular, non-religious basis. Marr created the term because before this time, all of the criticism of Jews was religious. It was the critique that I just gave you. The Jews kill Jesus Christ, and they are enemies of the entire human race. That is what St. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 2. 
Marr, like Wagner, was a revolutionary, revolutionary, 1848. He did not believe in Christianity. He was not a Christian. So he needed another form to come up with, and that's the creation of the term anti-Semitism. By the end of the 19th century, Napoleon's emancipation of the Jews had created so much havoc in European society through the corruption of morals that the Jews were, were good at, through the spread of usury, for the bondage that the people had fallen into in usury, that there was a, a European-wide reaction against the Jews. It was so powerful, it was so all-pervasive that the Catholic Church had to respond. And so in 1890, a three-part series on the Jewish question appeared in the official magazine of the Catholic Church, Civilta Cattolica. And what was this, the, the, the occasion of this magazine, occasion of these articles, was the 100th anniversary of the French Revolution. The Catholic Church says, what is the legacy of the French Revolution? What do we have to show after 100 years of revolution in France? And at the end of the essay, they come to one of the most startling sentences I've ever read, and I've read a lot. The, the author of this article, Catholic priest, says, any country that rebels against the laws that were put in place by a Christian prince will end up being ruled by the Jews. It was a stunning statement. It was one of those moments where you think, that's true. That's true. This, it was the rebellion against the Catholic Church in France that led to the enslavement of the, Cath of the Catholics in France by the Jews. That's what the church said. That was the official publication of the Catholic Church in 1890. Two years later, a man by the name of Ratzinger wrote a book called Judicious Erwerbsleben, or Jewish Business Practices. This Ratzinger his name was Georg Ratzinger. He is the great uncle of Pope Benedict XVI. What did he say? He said exactly the same thing that Chivo Tacatolic was. He was a Catholic politician. He said exactly the same thing. If you, if you don't enforce the Christian laws of your country, remember there's no separation of church and state here. These are Christian countries. If the Christian prince does not enforce the laws that were put in place to protect the Christian people, you will be, end up being ruled by the Jews. And that was the state in the Austro-Hungarian Empire at that moment. After the revolution of 1848, one of the Catholic textbooks that was read in every seminary in North America described it as, after the revelation, a swarm of Jewish usurers descended on Hungary. That was what was taught in seminaries, in Catholic, uh, Catholic seminaries in, at this period of time. This is what Georg Ratzinger said. A reaction against the Jewification, the Fayudum, this is my translation, of our culture is now building a momentum among the common man. That movement is barely perceptible today, but it is growing like an avalanche. That moment would be irresistible at this very moment if it weren't lacking a leader. What's the German word for leader? It's Führer. He said that in 1892. In 1933, the Germans got their Führer. A man who was familiar with the writings of Count Gobineau, Houston Stewart Chamberlain, and of course the American Madison Grant. This is where he got his racial theories. They were not German. They were a mishmash of other, other groups. In his address to the 1933 Nuremberg rally, Hitler attempted to formulate a theory of the German state based on the racial principles of the people I just mentioned. The secret of life, according to Hitler, was the preservation of purity of blood. Wagner's Parsifal was an example of this, according to Hitler. We are all suffering from the plague of mixed and contaminated blood. How can we purify and reconcile ourselves? That's what Hitler said in Mein Kampf. Confronted with this concern uh, of this sort, the father of Wilhelm Schmidt, the great uh, 
divine word anthropologist who, like the Jesuits, went to the Melanesian islands and the Polynesian islands and wrote grammars and dictionaries for these people. He talked about this in his book and tried to give a psychological explanation be, uh, with uh, describing Hitler's relationship to his father. This is what Pater, uh, Father Schmidt said. Through Hitler's influence, the mystical, ethical message of Wagner's Parsifal got transmuted into the materialistic, biological message of racial thought. Hitler was more deeply corrupted by racial thought than Wagner. He empathized with Gobineau for deeper reasons, probably because both men thought your purity of blood was important because both men were Ill illegitimate children, unsure of who their fathers were. Father Schmidt, my translation. Two years later, two years after 19, the 1933 Nuremberg rally, Hitler was back in Nuremberg, and this time he was, came, this time he's singing a different tune. In this, this, in this Nuremberg rally, Hitler repudiated the racial theories of 1933 and reverted to the German word Volk. No more Rasse. Now we're talking about Volk. In a stunning reversal of thinking that no one even knows about, much less who has explained. Race went unmentioned in that speech. Hitler instead went on to claim, and this is a direct quote, my translation, but a direct quote from Hitler, without some understanding of the states of antiquity and without the assistance of a Christian worldview, the idea of a German state would be unthinkable. In other words, Hitler, faced with the realities of governing the German nation, had to come to the conclusion that race was an inadequate explanation for the rise of unity among the German people. The only thing that explains this is the, the arrival of Christianity. In other words, the arrival of Logos, because Logos, the vehicle of Logos, is the Catholic Church. It came about in Greece hundreds of years before. It turned into magic left on its own. It was the Catholic Church that picked up Logos when St. John wrote the Gospel in Greek, and the Church has been the, the carrier of Logos ever since. The Church carried Logos to Paraguay. That's why Guarani is the, le the message of Paraguay, because of some Jesuit. The church today, in our, within our lives, carried the, the, the Logos to that tribe of little Indians living in trees, eating monkeys, and that's why they can survive today. The church is the vehicle of Logos. Without this Logos, there would be no German nation. We would have had a series of tribes uh, fighting with each other, which is the state of nature, each of them calling themselves human being, each of them referring to other tribes as something subhuman, living in a state of perpetual barbarism, perpetual slavery to their passions and the forces of nature. It was only the Catholic Church, bringer of Logos, that brought this about in Germany. The same thing happened in Mexico. You're obviously more familiar with the history of Mexico than I am. But uh, in the 16th century, the beginning of 16th century, there were all sorts of ethnic groups in Mexico being ruled over by one ethnic group, one super ethnic group, one master race known as the Aztecs. And the Aztecs would take prisoners and they built pyramids, a great civilization in a sense, a, a, a terrible civilization, but a great civilization, march their victims up the pyramid and cut out their hearts. And in 1498, right before the arrival of Cortes, 100,000 people, prisoners of the Aztecs, had their hearts cut out on this pyramid. The Aztecs were the ISIS of Mexico. Instead of cutting your head off, they cut your heart out. But that was not the end of history. We tend to think that history is always going to be like that. But history was on the verge of change, and then Cortes arrives from Spain. And Cortes has a couple hundred people against an empire of millions of people. And he marches into Mexico, and things go bad, and they have to escape. And there's that famous scene of escaping Mexico City in the middle of the night when the Aztecs are beating that huge drum, and the, the Spaniards are loaded down with gold, 
the gold that they've plundered from the Aztecs, and the causeway is, the bridge is missing in the causeway. So they jump in the water, and they go straight to the bottom, and they jump in, and finally, there are so many dead uh, Spaniards, you can walk across them. And finally, you get to the causeway, and Cortez takes uh, the troops finally to the shore, and Bernal de Diaz says there wasn't one man there who wasn't wounded. And Cortez turns to him, and he says, we're going back. He burns the ships, and he returns, and he conquers Mexico. It's one of the greatest stories in human history. But it was only the beginning, because what happened after that was even more powerful. The, 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 the growth of the German nation that took place over centuries in Europe took place in Mexico like that. It was a miracle. And you know the miracle I'm referring to. It's the miracle of Our Lady of Guadalupe. The Blessed Mother appears in history. She appears to Juan Diego, uh, tells him that she is the, the Blessed Mother, shows him roses, gives him roses in winter, and then the church is built. But the real miracle is the unification of Mexico. That's the real miracle, that all of these ethnic groups who have been fighting with each other, who have been enslaving with each other for millennia, who knows how long? The, these ethnic groups that would conquer another ethnic group and march them up a pyramid and cut their heart out, this was over. This period of history was over. And why was it over? Because the Logos had come to Mexico. And once the Logos comes, it never goes away. You know? So that's the miracle. That's what we, that's, that's, that's the proof these two instances, that ethnos cannot survive without logos. The ethnos that has no logos, we don't even know who they are anymore. We don't know their names. They've disappeared from the face of history. The ethnos that has logos, the ethnos that can join with other groups and create a nation, they are the actors in history. And that's what I'm here to talk about today. Because as I said, history is moving now. History, this is the genius of Hegel. History is the pro progressive revelation of the mind of God. History is reason. History is reason becoming conscious of itself. We live in a world now where people know things they didn't know before. I went to a town in a little town I never heard of in the middle of a desert in Iran, the hottest place on earth. I go into town. There's 700 people there waiting to hear me talk. This is world consciousness. Who are these people? I don't know. There's my picture on a billboard. How did I get this way? Because this is, this, what we're seeing now is a unification of the entire world. Okay? It's not going to be one homogeneous group. We're going to have nations because that's important. Because God created nations. He created nations out of ethnic groups, which he also created. God does not want a world of undifferentiated, helpless individuals. The nation is what protects you from other nations. That's what God wants. But he wants it. There's only one way the nation is going to survive, and that is through Logos. And through our understanding, our reading of how Logos moves throughout history. Thank you very much.